good question. Like, why is that guy sitting there on the ramp of an airport playing his guitar? I promise I'll provide you with an answer to that question in the course of this video. I'm back here in Baal today, or to be more precise, at the airport of Baal, which is already located behind Switzerland's border with France, inside France. And I came here to fly a French airplane, or rather the French airplane, because I think it's fair to say that the manufacturer who built the plane behind me there might very well be the one with the biggest heritage, with the biggest uh, history of all the European airplane manufacturers in general aviation. And yes, you read the title and you might be a bit of an F geek as well, so you know that I'm, of course, talking of uh, Robin Aircraft. This plane behind me is one of the latest DR400s. It's kind of uh, the Skyhawk of the company, if you want a comparison, almost 3,000 of these planes have been built and delivered since uh, the 1970s. And Roba markets those now as the DR401, which is kind of the next generation, the next uh, step in the evolution of their best-selling product. And I came here today to take a little demo flight with my flight instructor Michael in it today to find out what uh, makes these aircraft so special and why they are so popular here in Europe. Let's do it. Let me talk you through this plane a little before we set off for the flight. If you wanted to compare this to other planes in this segment, you'll soon come across uh, one thing that sets it apart from the competition, which is the material it's made of, which is wood. Yes, I know what you're thinking, like this belongs in a museum then and shouldn't be promoted as something modern, you But don't get judged too early. The DR-401 is a fully part 23 certified airplane. It has four seats, a nice interior, modern avionics, including a digital autopilot, IFR certification and a modern engine. There's even a big advantage the wooden construction has, which we'll look at in a minute. Engine-wise, Roman's customers can uh, choose between a number of uh, different like coming Afghas burning engines for their DR-401, but also opt for a Continental CD-155 uh, jet fuel burning engine like this one in here. Actually, most dr 401 seem to leave the factory with the diesel engine. This is the engine that started life as a Tila Centurion, had kind of a rough childhood, if you wish. And after the bankruptcy of Tila Motors in 2008, it moved to Continental, but is still being uh, built in Germany today. Now, after all the years, it is uh, now quite a proven engine with more than uh, 5,000 units uh, built. The replacement times of the gearbox and the engine itself have uh, gone up to 1200 hours for the gearbox and to 2100 hours for the engine itself and uh, the reli reliability has also been much improved. Compared to a 180 horsepower Afghaz burning engine, the Continental uses up to 40% uh, less fuel at uh, similar performance. One of the main reasons why these efficient jet fuel burning engines didn't take over the industry is the higher weight of the power plant. The combination of the CD-155 and the Cessna 172 or a Piper Archer kind of turns these planes into three-seater aircraft. Yes, there will of course still be four seats, but not enough useful load to actually put in four adults and fuel to actually go flying. And I know what I'm talking about because uh, there are four diesel converted Skyhawks in the flying club where I've been flying the past years. Now the Roban doesn't have this kind of issue. It's not because the engine would be any different, it's exactly the same, but uh, with the lightweight wooden construction and the improved Oratex uh, coating of the airframe and the wings, uh, the empty weight of this plane here is only 699 kilograms. So despite the heavier diesel, you'll still have 400 kilograms of useful load available. And this value is just unprecedented. None of the competitors in this specific, specific market uh, segment that have the option for a, a jet fuel burning engine reach this value. Not Cessna, not Piper, nor does Technam with their new P2010 TDI or Diamond with uh, the DA40NG. So to make things more practical, you can take along four passengers, you can put in a number of bags and still put in fuel for three hours. And that's almost Cessna Skylane territory. Only the size of the baggage compartment is a little smaller than what I'm used to. Partly because uh, the DR401 carries its fuel in the fuselage. The main tank is located under the rear seats, while in this specific model there is an auxiliary fuel tank under the baggage compartment shown here. While I mounted all the cameras for the flight, Michael, my flight instructor, had done the pre-flight check. 
But of course you might be curious how that goes, so Michael will give you a little tour around the plane before we finally go flying. The flaps, electric driven flaps, um, they're always down while the aircraft's on the ground, so you're not going to step on it while you enter or leave the aircraft. You always compare uh, the set of the flaps with the flap switch. So there. p 2 heat cover removed. We got something special here for the diesel engine. There's a kind of peephole um, where we check the gear, the gear oil, that the gear has sufficient oil in there. It's fine. Stall warning. Let's go to the elevator. Go play. I'm moving consistently. Trim is connected. And the rudder. Connected. Fine. Okay. Something that I want to mention is that this plane is owned by the local flying club here in Baal. They offer a nice little fleet of four well-maintained airplanes and offer those at fair hourly rates starting at an impressive 121 Swiss francs for their Cessna 172. If this is the first time for you that um, you see the diesel engine start, that might be actually a bit interesting for you. Maybe we just close the hood so it's not too loud after the engine start. Um, like this, right? So it's closed. Perfect. Um, because all you got to do is turn on the flashlight, the strobe light that's been done already. We turn on the fuel pump and turn on the engine master, which will in turn power the FADEC. You can see that uh, the engine indication has come on. Also, the glow plug has come on, which means the uh, glow plugs in the cylinders are now preheating the cylinders and the FADEC lights have uh, come off. And now the glow, once the glow light is extinguished, all we got to do is make sure the prop is clear and we start the engine and it's running. The oil pressure is in the green range and we got to switch this button again. And that's it. I have to say it's, it's quite a bit of a cold day outside. We have the cold outside temperatures now with the light coming. The, cold start procedure is always a bit fiddling around with the mixture and all the controls and it's uh, just this simple and reliable with the diesel every single time in all outside conditions I could think of. You read down the time for me. Thank you. The brakes are working apparently. So the nose wheel is uh, connected to the rudder so you don't need to use the brakes too much for steering I guess. On ground the robot does indeed react very sensitive to your rudder and steering inputs. Especially during takeoff roll and uh, touching goes this requires a little caution and takes a moment uh, to get used to, which I'll soon be finding out. Now if you're used to the, G to the G1000 or any of the GNS430 or 530s, um, it's imp impressive how crisp these, uh, these two screens are actually. It's, uh, the resolution is awesome, it's, it's really like an iPad or something. Really cool. So we do the run up. Now that might be interesting for you guys as well. We have a coolant and uh, oil temperature already within the green range. So all you do is make sure the throttle is in idle and we hit that FADEC test button there and you'll see the engine goes through its run up sequence. Now the FADEC lights come on. First FADEC B. Here the the prop being feathered, now fading A light is coming on. Same procedure there on that side. Now the lights are extinguished. Throttle is back to a about a thousand RPM and the test is completed. Now that's basically all that needs to be done for the run up. That's how simple running up the diesel engine is. It's awesome. Hotel Bravo Kilo Garcia, line up runway 15 uh, intersection hotel and wait. Line up 1 5 intersection, hotter and waiting, hotter goes Sierra. Sorry? Approach is clear. Alright, approach sector is clear, runway 1 5 has been identified. Fuel is good, and the heading is gonna be at 1 5 3 initially. Perfect. Hotel Bravo, Kilo Garcia, runway 1 5 clear for takeoff, wind 0 8 0 degrees 7 knots. Attack of runway 1 5, uh, hotter goes Sierra. Are you ready? 
I'm ready. Let's do it. Take off. So we have all the engine instruments in the green range. The airspeed is alive. We'll be rotating at uh, 61. It's pretty quick, this thing. 61, there it is. Oh, quite sensitive. And VY78 initially. So we're clear of obstacles. Full laps are coming up. That climb was like crazy. Okay. That's uh, quite the climb performance. That's a lot better than anything I'm used to with the 172. Even though I know this engine, I was really surprised with the performance it delivered in this airframe. The acceleration and climb performance are really impressive. The climb rate uh, with the two of us on board averaged more than a thousand feet per minute while in a cruise climb at around 85 knots. Now viewers, I'm not sure if that's coming through on the video. But the view outside of this is just impressive. I, I mean, the canopy is huge. It, it really bulges out at the sides, and I mean, I've flown like diamonds, pipers, technams, but the view in this is uh, it's a bit different than what I'm used to. It's just really extraordinary. And let's be honest. I mean, we as general aviation pilots, especially here in Europe, most Mostly fly just for leisure and for fun and for doing a bit of sightseeing and for just enjoying the, the flying that we do and having a, a view like this is just something uh, well, definitely an advantage compared to what you usually have in a, in a Piper like where the windows are just a lot smaller. Yeah. So for leisure it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 3027 now at 70 percent the AFM says uh, you can expect a ground speed of about uh, 112, 111, 112 knots and 4,000 feet, so that's exactly what we're seeing now and that's quite good, I mean ground speed now is uh, 127 with tailwind, 120 on the true airspeed, that's pretty impressive actually, it's not bad. And the leather seats are pretty comfortable as well, I have to say. Yep. I like them. Put some fresh air in. I bet our uh, body size is still enough space. Yeah. Now I'm 1 meter 73 tall and found the seating really comfortable. The seats can be adjusted, but they'll do so as simultaneously for height and reach and will also tilt backwards as you move aft. According to Michael, some of the taller pilots in the club find this a little less comfortable. We left the region of Bal westbound for some turns and stalls. The steep turns worked well right from the beginning and reminded me how intuitive flying with a center stick can be. This definitely is the controller arrangement that I prefer over a yoke or a side stick. Oh, that's my old wigs. <laughs> All right. Another angle of attack there. So we're in cover. In the stalls, the Oban behaves like a well educated pony, kind of a one on which children can get their first horse riding lesson. It's waiting patiently, letting you know clearly when it's slowly reaching critical AOA but never appears to get violent in any way. The recovery is equally simple. Nothing bad to report here. While we're being vectored onto the ILS back into Baal, let me tell you a few words about the history of this legendary company that roots back to World War II. A man called Jean Delimontes joined the French Air Force and having succeeded in School of Mechanics before, he was assigned to do maintenance duties for fighter planes. Being obsessed with airplanes, he sketched his own ideas and designs for light aircraft. 
Shortly after World War II was over, in 1946, he founded the Jodel Aircraft Society together with his father-in-law. He quickly came up with his first plane, a single-seat wooden airplane they called the Baby Jodel. The airplane already had the characteristic wing shape and proved to work quite well, so he managed to sell the plans for building this aircraft to amateur builders and companies uh, to build their own. In a time just after the war, where the country was desperately lacking pilots and airplanes, the model soon became the reference for new concepts who could be used in pilot training in the flying clubs across the country. Hundreds of these uh, Jodel aircraft were built in the 1950s. It was at the time that a flight instructor at the flying club in Dijon called Pierre Robin aimed to build an entirely new three-seater within one year together with his students. They worked on the plane whenever the weather didn't permit flying. Still the progress was a little slower than they had hoped for, so Mr. Robin went to ask Mr. Delemontes, who had his company right at the same spot, if he could buy a wing for the fuselage that they had finished already. The man decided to finish this project together. The result was called the DR100, DR standing for the initials of their designers, and it attracted quite some attention. Pierre Robin received orders to build more of these planes and the success story started. The first DR400 was then delivered in 1972. Neither a catastrophic fire in the factory shortly after its launch nor the old crisis at the end of the 1970s ever managed to entirely kill the DR400. Where do you set your minimums in here? With the... Go to menu, to the left bottom. Go to minimums. Ah, and set your minimum. You just need to first switch on Baro. Yeah. And then you can uh, put in your minimum. Michael helped me to set up the instrument approach in the GTN 750 Navigator and the G500 TXI. This is the first time that I'm flying with these touchscreen systems and even though they are a lot more intuitive uh, to use compared to the G1000, it still takes some getting used to and might be more difficult to control in turbulence because of the missing knobs. You got a DME? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I really like the screen. Now, yeah. Of course, if you wanted to look for something that other manufacturers might do better, I, I love all of that. I think with the G1000 that all the others kind of put into the plane, there's a bit more integration. You have uh, like the engine instruments hey, integrated, you have the autopilot integrated. I, kind, I sort of miss the, as a, an airline pilot, I sort of miss having a proper FMA. Like the little bar up there, but now that's a really, a really talky crest world problem. I mean, the aircraft is full of. Full, yeah. 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 All the lights are on. Right heading 120 degrees, clear the Zulu 15. Right head 120, clear the Zulu 15. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Glide slope is armed. All right, that did it automatically as well. The glide slope is indicated up here as well. In the approach itself, the autopilot performed nicely, but compared to the GFC 700 that you usually see in the G1000 avionics, it seemed to me that the Aztec 55X autopilot in here might be a little less sophisticated. It uh, took longer to correct the localizer deviation you are seeing here, which is why I then turned it off. But I have to say, all the comparison made here is a little unfair as the avionics solution in this Roma here is definitely cheaper than the entire G1000 avionics suite. And let's be honest, we're really talking first world problems here. Target speed. Speed's a little low. A little low. Eleven o'clock. Aircraft. 
system is off. Eleven yeah, o'clock. Aircraft. Ten o'clock. Aircraft. Eight o'clock. It's not recognizable in the video, but after applying full power of the touch and go, I was struggling a bit with the directional control and these sensitive rudder pedals. But as we did a couple more touch and goes, I got used to this quickly. And even though I was flaring a little too high and actually kept doing so on the subsequent touch and goes, the landing gear managed to cope with my lack of talent uh, well and absorb the energy nicely. Appreciate threshold 15 for touchdown, then how they got here. Hotel Gosia, you are number one, report uh, final runway 15. Welcome number one, uh, next report final 15, Hotel Gosia. I kind of fell in love with the plane on that flight. Yes, it has its flaws, the baggage compartment could be a little bigger and the engine instruments, annunciators and autopilot could be better integrated into the glass panel. But nothing, really nothing beats the visibility in this. The useful load is excellent and the performance is pretty good as well. And yes, you might still ask if wood is the right choice to build airframes in the 21st century. Let me just tell you this, hundreds of Jodels and Robans are still flying all across Europe. Many of them are more than twice as old as I am. Maybe it's a little like my acoustic guitar. At the first glance it might not be the most modern thing in the world. In times where music gets produced on a laptop rather than recorded. But it's only after you feel it and touch it and play with it that you'll truly be able to appreciate the work that someone has put into its creation. And it's only then that you'll truly be able to understand what a great natural composite this is. Wood. Now guys, that was an awesome experience for me, the first time flying a robot aircraft here in Baal. Thanks Michael for your time, it was awesome. I have to say Michael took his uh, free time, took the day off just for me filming this video. Really appreciate that, again thank you. If you want to fly this airplane yourself, just uh, make sure to visit uh, the homepage of the flying club that owns this plane here. I'll of course uh, link that down in the video description and you see it also here below. Thank you so much for uh, watching. As always, I want to know your opinion on uh, this beautiful plane. Let me know what you think about it, what you think about the flight. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe this channel. Thank you for watching. All the best and uh, as always, many happy landings out there.